Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. It's wonderful to have Brian, uh, Dr. Mark, Brian McVeigh back talking about applications of Julian Jane's ideas to personal go growth and, um, and uh, therapy. So what are we talking about today, Brian? So today it's going to be about um, self-individuation. And that is a, uh, another feature of uh, conscious interiority. And um, uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm going down the list of the key features of what I think constitute a human consciousness and what the therapeutic relationships, um, what, what, what can we learn from a therapeutic perspective about these different features. So do you want me to put uh, my PowerPoint up now? Yes, let's, let's do that. Okay. And if I have questions as you're going along, may I ask the questions as you go along? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. It, did it? Uh, yes, I can see it, but I can, uh, you need to, yeah, play it. Okay, now it is showing in the mode where I'm seeing the next slide, main slide and the next, yeah, perfect. Let me just select that. Okay, can you see it okay yes. now? It's good. All right, so thank you everybody for uh, coming uh, tonight, for attending. And so, as I said, uh, we're going to be talking about self-individuation and the subtitle, um, as you can see, what are the social benefits of highlighting individual differences? In other words, from a social perspective or from the perspective of a community, why is self-individuation important? So it's important not just for the individual to find out, to self-discover what's special and unique about me, um, but the idea is this type of self-discovery helps others. So, for those of you who have been to my previous podcast, this slide here will look familiar to you. This is just a list of what I believe to be uh, the key features of consciousness, or as I prefer to be more clear, conscious interiority. We've talked about uh, about half a dozen of them so far. Um, and obviously tonight I'm talking about self-individuation. That's, that's highlighted in red. And this, I'm, I'm going down this list, not in any particular order, but in any case. So I always think that it's very important to begin any discussion like this from an historical point of view to understand exactly what conscious interiority is. Because according to Jamesian psychology, the, the, the ideas of Julian Jaynes, there was a time when people were not conscious. They were what we might describe as being pre-conscious. And of course, people, if they were not conscious, would lack these features of conscious interiority that I've already mentioned. Specifically, they would not have what I call self-individuation. They would have some, there would be, of course, to some degree, a notion that people were different, that people played different roles, that there's something unique about it in each individual, I suppose, but it would not be stressed. It would not be highlighted. It would not be, uh, the way I would put it, it would not be psychologized to the degree that it is in modern conscious times. And to look for evidence of this, or to make my argument, I think a good place to begin is by comparing representations of the individual, how people were, how individual persons were portrayed. So for example, if we go back in ancient Egypt, these representations here are from a time when Egyptians were not conscious and therefore they would lack self-individuation. And if you look at these representations, it's difficult to distinguish the different individuals. I mean, you can distinguish them from what they are wearing, 
There are some gender markers. There are some markers of royalty. But overall, what we would call personal traits or individuality is very difficult to find. There were exceptions. There were exceptions. But for centuries, the idea is that individuality or personality really didn't matter that much to the degree that it does in modern conscious times. The other example in this slide is from uh, Mesopotamia. These, and if you look at these different statues carefully, pretty much the faces all look the same, right? I mean, there are some differences, some have beards, I suppose, but other than that, individuality simply is not emphasized. So if we jump ahead, from pre-conscious to uh, conscious times, then we begin to see a focus on personality traits, on what is special and unique about each individual. And so on the, uh, if you look to the left, uh, my left of um, the, the slide, those examples are from ancient Egypt, from around the first century BC to the second, third century AD. And it's very clear that these people were conscious. It's very clear that these people possessed self-individuation. And then the other examples are from the Roman period. And again, that was a, a period when people were conscious, obviously. And you can see how uh, the artist who created these uh, the, the, these statues paid close attention to what was different about each person, about each individual. Those, and by the way, those examples from Egypt, I think some of those uh, were painted on mummies. Um, and you can see they're, they're very beautiful. These examples are from, I think, well, they're from Europe, but I think probably around 1000 AD, give or take a century. And he, what's happened, uh, for whatever reason, self-individuation has sort of regressed. It doesn't seem to be that important for the people who created uh, these examples. If you look at the different faces, it's, it's not easy to discern what we might call personality or individual differences. They pretty much look very similar. I mean, if you look very closely, there are some differences, I suppose. Um, but uh, if, if, if you look at the example on the left uh, with the two men and the two women, I mean, they, they actually, I think they're supposed to be just one, they're supposed to be two people, I, I, I think. But if you look at the, the um, in, in movement, but if you look at the, the faces of the, the male and the female, they, they look, uh, very similar. But by the time we get to the 1300s, 1400s, certainly by the 1500s, the Renaissance, now self-individuation self has returned in artistic representation. And there is a very close attention to individual detail and what is unique about each person. And again, this is a reflection, I think, of a change in cognition a change in uh, consciousness. So individuation, just let me uh, give a sort of brief, uh, some brief definitions. Individuation, uh, an individual's personal traits are highlighted and privileged by society or within some larger collectivity. So in other words, a society more or less is telling you what your individuality is all about. However, Self-individuation, and that's a, a process that occurs among conscious people. One's eye comes to appear unique when set against the backdrop of other facets of one's selfhood. And so in other, in other words, one's different me's and roles and in theorized exceptions. And so uh, the, the I and the me that I'm mentioning here, exceptions, uh, um, these are, of course, other features of conscious interiority. So just uh, let me go back here. So the reason why I want to point this out is I want to make it clear. If you look at this list down towards the end, you see I, me, and then on top you see excerption. So 
I'm pointing this out to show how these different features of conscious interiority are actually very much interrelated. Um, and it's, it's not always easy to uh, clearly uh, separate them out, but in any case. So this idea of self-individuation, as I said, this is something that started to emerge when societies became, when individuals became conscious uh, sometime after 1000 BCE. Self-individuation self is what happens when we consciously interiorize our individuality. In other words, our I indiv individuates our me. So this is a very psych psychologized, it, it's, a, it's an ugly word, but a sort of psychologization, psychologization uh, to psychologize the individual. Self-individuation promotes not just personal, but also the collective good, since it highlights an individual's unique talents that can benefit others. So this is something I mentioned at the beginning of tonight's podcast. Self-individuation has great adaptive value for society as a whole, not just for the individual. And in fact, all the features of conscious interiority have an adaptive value. That's why they evolved. That's why they emerged in the first place. I mean, that's why consciousness or conscious interiority itself emerged. It was a way to adjust, a way to accommodate great social upheaval and changes that occurred about 3,000 years ago. So this is an important aspect of self-individuation that I want to um, emphasize. Um, and so, so what, what, what happens here? Well, the idea is that one's self-discovered personal strengths can then be mobilized to help others. Discovering one's personal traits not only aids the individual, but is also a boon to others who then benefit from one's contributions, whatever contributions one makes to society. So in other words, it's inherently valuable for people to encourage what is special, what is different about other people because those differences are what make any community, any society, any political system stronger. So now what I wanna do is switch gears a little bit and look at self-individuation from a therapeutic perspective. What, what are the therapeutic implications of self-individuation? And I'll start with person-centered therapy or what some people call client-centered therapy. And of course, if you're familiar with counseling or if you're a counselor yourself, you'll know uh, who Carl Rogers is. And uh, many counselors use his principles uh, uh, during counseling sessions and they may not even be aware of it. So in the same way that Freud, Freudianism for better or, or for worse has sort of seeped uh, sort of uh, become a part of counseling, whether we know it or not. I think this is also true with uh, Rogerian counseling or person-centered therapy. So for Rogers, a uh, core condition of his brand of therapy uh, is empathy. So the idea here is each person is a self-individuated being possessed of a rich, intro cosmos requiring exploration. So intro cosmos, that's just another word for our inner universe or what we might call uh, inner verse, if you will. So the idea here is that rather than when you first meet a client or a patient, rather than trying to jump to a conclusion about what is wrong with this person or labeling them with some sort of diagnostic category, for Rogers, what was important is to assume that not only do I not know this person, but it's going to take me a lot of time to get to know this person. And th this person has the right to sort of sit there and articulate their very being. And th this, uh, uh, the, 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 the premise here is that people cannot self-heal unless they are given some sort of platform to articulate or to articulate not just their problems, but to articulate what they think uh, is special about them as a being. 
So the therapist should endeavor to to be to, to be open uh, to uh, a client's subjective conscious innerverse, and that allows the therapist to better understand where they're coming from, to understand their, their worldview. Another core condition of Rogerian or person-centered therapy is unconditional positive regard. So in other words, the therapist accepts clients without any judgment. And by doing so, the therapist affords them self-dignity and respect and makes an effort to listen actively to whatever they're saying. And again, not to jump to any conclusions and to not give any advice. And this way, the client's self-individuation as well as their self-autonomy and self-authorization are validated and respect is shown uh, to the individual. And of course, this builds what we call therapeutic alliance or a healthy working relationship. And that will facilitate um, the healing process because the, the, the person is allowed to tell you what is bothering them. Um, it, it, the, the, the person is given a type of freedom that they perhaps lack in their other relationships outside of the clinical setting. So another way to look at self-individuation within the context of therapy is this idea of boundaries. And that's a word that, uh, of course, counselors use a lot, not just in gestalt therapy, but in, in the, the many different types of uh, systems of psychotherapy. But in any case, with gestalt, boundaries have two functions. The first, they connect individuals. The idea is that people are interdependent, reliant on each other. There's a sort of uh, in, inherent affiliation that people have toward one another. But at the same time, self-individuation, excuse me, boundaries, I should say, can, uh, it separates people. And that's neither good or, nor bad, but the idea is that people should be independent and boundaries help maintain self-autonomy and that leads to a healthier self-individuation. Something that we hear a lot about is this idea of enmeshed relations, especially in family therapy. Uh, so the idea is that certain family members, perhaps a married couple, become overly involved in each other's lives and the boundaries between person A and person B have eroded, perhaps they've even collapsed. And of course, that is not a good thing for developing, for cultivating self-individuation. Uh, and that applies, of course, to other features of conscious interiority, self-autonomy and self-authorization. So again, you can see how all these things overlap and are very much related. We can look at self-individuation from the perspective of existential therapy. And the idea, a key idea in the existential therapy is this notion of existential isolation. And that's the price that conscious humans pay for possessing consciousness, specifically for possessing self-reflexivity, and a self-individuated self I. So these different features of conscious interiority lead to the realization that each of us is somehow fundamentally separated from others in the world. Usually we don't think that, right? Because we're too busy. But if we're given the time to be alone, I mean, to really be alone with ourselves and to think things through, so, sometimes some of us enter uh, a dark night of the soul, as someone once put it, and we sort of look at this abyss and we wait for an answer to come out of that abyss. We wait, we wait for some sort of voice and we don't hear anything. And then we realize that 
It's not just a matter of being alone. It's a matter of being fundamentally alienated or separated from the rest of reality. Only humans can do that. And for some people, that might be a sort of, uh, they might get, get some insight out of uh, religious experience like that, I suppose. But for other people, it can be a very uncomfortable, even terrifying experience for those of us who have, have experienced something like that. So sentiments of isolation may lead to feelings of profound disaffection. And though they can be reduced from an existentialist point of view, they can never be completely eliminated. Being human means, being a conscious human, I should say, means to be fundamentally, uh, often it means, not always, I suppose, but for some of us, it can mean that we have this feeling of being at odds with the rest of the universe. So self-individuation is grounded in and nourished, look at things from perhaps a more positive point of view, by an individual's own inner universe or our own intro cosmos. And this relates to this idea of the idioverse that was uh, written about by the psychotherapist Saul uh, Rosenweig. And for him, he, he was not satisfied with the notion of personality. He wanted to go beyond that and have a, a more nuanced concept. And so he used this idea of an idioverse. And I think idioverse resonates uh, with other terms that I've been using to try and capture this sense that each individual possesses within them some sort of intro cosmos or the universe, however you want to um, uh, express it. The idioverse describes the totality of an, individual, of an individual's experiences and the unique events of a person's life. And this actually relates to this notion of, uh, that I'll talk about in a moment, of creativity. For, uh, for Rosenweig, an idioverse actually was part of what he called idiodynamics. And I won't spend too much time on this, but the idea is that um, th th this concerns the individual search for personal integration. And how is that accomplished? Well, it can be accomplished uh, in many ways, I suppose, but I think creativity and curiosity um, have a lot to do in uh, what we might call, uh, as I said, personal integration. So self-individuation self -individu concerns getting to know the different aspects of one's selfhood. It, it, it relates to a type of self-discovery and we can, we can facilitate that self-discovery th through uh, acts of creativity. But when we talk about creativity, it doesn't necessarily have to concern art in the traditional conventional sense. I mean, there are many, many ways for a person to be creative, right? It could have something to do um, with scientific discovery. Uh, it could have something to do with writing. It could have something to do with figuring out how to help other people, right? In any case, being creative concerns uh, authenticity and it leads to a, a sort of vitality and making connections, making connections, not just with the world around us, but making connections with other people. And as I just said, creativity, it's not just about expressing oneself in an artistic endeavor, but um, it can be applied to uh, emotional and uh, intellectual uh, enterprises. One way to describe creativity is uh, as adaptive originality. And uh, I, of course, I think many people would agree if you're working in education, it's important to cultivate this as early as possible, th this idea 
of, uh, of uh, uh, the value of being crea uh, creative because this acts as a foundation, of course, for a healthy self-individuation. Being creative, creativity, I think um, is very much related to this notion of curiosity. And I mention it, there's actually been some research on curiosity in and of itself, but I think that this is a sentiment that is often neglected and underappreciated. Um, but I think that um, in the same way that self-individuation, if we nourish our own self-individuation, not only will that help society at large, I also think that being curious will too, because this leads us to uh, problem solving. So it can benefit social relations and uh, enhance uh, positive emotions. So let's look at uh, self-individuation from another angle, uh, from a Jungian therapeutic perspective. Jung actually used this word a lot, individuation, and it, it, it pretty much overlaps uh, with the way I've been using self-individuation. But in any case, for Jung, individu individuation was about, it was a process in which one's elements of personality emerge out of one's unconsciousness and are integrated. And for Jung paid a lot of attention to how a person can contain opposite traits. And for him, it was a challenge. How can these opposite traits be balanced? Because the idea is that we're all multidimensional. We all, as I said before, contain these inner universes. And of course, because we're, we're so rich with all these different features, there inevitably are going to be traits that oppose one another. There are going to be things that work in opposite directions. That, that, that's just what it means to be human. So from a Jungian perspective, the idea is that, uh, well, the, the role of a therapist is to make clients consciously aware of these different elements um, from their personal unconscious, but also from what Jung called the collective unconscious. Now, I know that um, I'm, I, I don't practice Jungian therapy myself, but I do know that some therapists are a little uncomfortable with the notion of collective unconscious. That, that concept sounds a bit too mystical for some people. But in any case, uh, certainly there's no reason why we cannot view the, the collective unconscious as um, something perhaps less mystical, perhaps as an identity affording group to which, to which an individual belongs, or um, it, 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 it could be anything actually, so some, some grand vision of what it means um, uh, to be a person. In any case, self-individuation self highlights our uniqueness and our self-identity. And this is also a very Jungian way of looking at things. Um, when we talk about self-individuation, we can view it as related to an immediate goal or something that occurs throughout one's entire life. In other words, there is always a journey to go on. The journey never ends. Related to uh, this Jungian view of individuation, very important idea of archetypes. Now, these are images representing different facets of a person's mind. Uh, the better known ones are anima, animus, persona, shadow, supreme being, hero. And the idea is that these archetypes of one's personality um, inform how one views the world. And so the idea is of self-discovery to find out 
how is my persona shaping the way I view the world? How, how is the shadow, whatever that is for a particular person, um, how does that relate to uh, me as a person? So archetypes, as I already pointed out, I mean, th th these involve um, th different aspects of one's being, uh, the commonly used example, one's feminine, masculine side, um, the search for meaning. These primordial images, according to Jung, are in or somehow are inherited from what he referred to as the collective unconscious. And as I said, some people doubt the existence of this collective unconscious. It sounds a bit uh, mystical. Um, this, this sort of psychic storehouse. It's very difficult to prove scientifically if something like that actually exists. But in any case, I mean, if someone comes to me and they say that uh, they believe that they want to work through their archetypes or they want to talk about an, an image that is important to them and they believe that it comes from what they refer to as their collective unconscious, so I, I, I can't judge that if it's going to help someone um, facilitate their path towards self-healing. There's, no, there's uh, certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, but it, it's, in any case, these things relate to uh, the, the self-individualizing healing. So related to this uh, Jungian approach is what is called the transcendence of opposites. Integrating psychic material uh, I would call these uh, the, the, uh, these uh, this psychic material uh, different me's in roles, um, and, and the idea is that <clears throat> excuse me sometimes these me's and roles are taking us in different directions. So how do we transcend these opposites, or how do we at least balance them? So I guess you could say that we could stand above these dichotomies and again, to rely on other features of conscious interiority, one's eye excerpts these polar opposites and embraces these contradictions rather than trying to uh, suppress them or keep them unconscious, <coughs> excuse me. And hopefully what emerges in our attempt to transcend opposites is a third uh, element that helps us on our path toward self-individuation. So this word here, anantiodromia, which is uh, not an easy word to pronounce. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. It comes from the Greek. Um, it means something like literally opposite running course. The idea is that all things eventually turn into or, re or are replaced by their opposite. This describes what Jung referred to as necessary opposition and uh, what he called path of individuation, what I would call uh, self-individuation. Um, I don't spend too much time on this, but in any case, I just wanted to make this uh, connection because I think it's very important to show how uh, it, it's more of a cliche to say that uh, people are, are complicated. When you sit down and really try to get to know yourself or try to get to know someone that you think you've known for many years, especially try that, try to, try to uh, ask, just ask yourself, do I really know this person as well as I do? Um, and uh, if you really pay attention to that person, if from a Rogerian point of view, you actually have empathy and you try to understand them unconditionally and you take into account the fact that though you've known this person for many years, over that time, probably they have had many experiences, different experiences that have made them uh, a different person. So in any case, the sort of return to this Union perspective, <coughs> one incorporates an imposing archetype and tries to achieve what we might call psychic completion. 
but it's important to emphasize that this never ends, this journey of transcending and balancing these different facets of, our, of ourselves. They may not be opposites, right? But they're, these different facets of ourselves are certainly always um, competing with each other. So uh, I'm gonna end there and I'd be uh, more than happy to um, hear what people have to uh, say. Wonderful uh, folks. So it's time for questions. Um, how about we get all the questions that you have and then we can go ahead and uh, answer all of them together. And we'll have Brian answer all of them together. So if you have any question, go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat. We'll collect all the questions and ask all the questions. I want to let you know that we have a meetup at nine o'clock and um, it's going to be on connecting ideas that you have found useful in the entire range of ideas that we cover in 52 Living Ideas. It's going to be an invitation to connect different ideas. And uh, Brian, if you could stay for a few minutes after nine o'clock, I would like to ask you uh, some, I would like to have a conversation with you about Jung's idea of individuation and your idea of self-individuation or okay. Julian Jane's approach to individuation, sure. because that would be a really fascinating discussion. Uh, so folks, go ahead and type exclamation mark uh, if you have questions. Your questions take priority. I always have tons of questions for Brian. So uh, because you're not asking, so I'm going to start with that. Um, Brian, we've spent a lot of time on Carl Jung at these meetups. We've done more than 50 meetups. <clears throat> Most of these meetups had like three to four Jungian analysts talking about various concepts of Jung. Um, the concept of individuation, as I understand it, you know what? I, we, we will come to my questions. My questions are going to be second priority because we, we can always do this immediately after nine o'clock. Uh, folks, go ahead and type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom to ask questions. Jeff. Well, Srikant, I think you were headed towards my question. As well. Go for it. <laughs> so, um, so Brian, I'm I'm really um, I, I'm totally with you, and you know, no pressure here. You're, you're only you know trying to answer the, the ultimate questions regarding the meaning of life. But but beyond that, um, this 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 subject of um, this question about transcendence. Um, you know, as either equilibrium or somehow embracing, uh, you know, competing uh, facets of ourselves or somehow combining or, or as one, uh, one young friend said to me recently, do you, do you mean mashup? And I said, well, yes, yeah, sorta, you know, um, I, I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about that because you sort of, you know, you named it and, and gave a few sentences about it, but I think that it's a very rich um, subject. And uh, so, you know, not only a little bit more about what does it mean, but really how, you know, how is that achieved, you know, in, in a higher, higher self kind of way? Um. Well, I'm, I think how it's achieved in a higher way, I think it's going to depend on each individual. And that's really the, the mystery, but also, I suppose, for some people, the frustrating thing about self-individuation, because the more each of us self-individuates, the more different we're going to be. We're going all in different directions. And um, again, depends how you look at things. If you're a dictator, that's a bad thing. If you're a union, a liberal union, I suppose, that's a wonderful, good thing. That says something rich about what it means to be humans. And I think the, the idea here is that it, the, the journey, at least while we're alive, never ends. And in previous podcasts, I've talked about the importance of looking at the human condition, more specifically at looking at the human mind as something temporal. That something, it's something that cannot be understood outside of time. And what I mean by that, things are constantly, the mind is constantly 
upgrading. It's constantly changing. It's being challenged. It will not survive. It will not work unless it's able to change. So in a way, we're condemned to transcendence, I, I suppose, is a, a one way to put it. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Katie followed by Dave. Katie. I'm wondering what Roger would would think about one of the beliefs that I hold. And that is, um, I believe that you can analogize, they, someone might not have been in the same experience on the exact same thing, but they could analogize from other experiences that they've had to that experience. How, what would Roger say to something like that? Well, I'm not sure exactly what he would say, but um, certainly I think that's something that we do all the time. Um, even though each experience is never exactly the same as a previous experience, there's going to be something different. Nevertheless, we do use analogies. We do build upon uh, other uh, previous experiences. And of course, this is a, another way to talk about it from a Jamesian perspective is this idea of metaphors, using one thing to describe something else. And again, that's what it means to be uh, a person and to analogize really is just another form, another example of adaptation. We really can't get through life unless we uh, analogize. Yeah, I mean, th that's a big point in uh, Julian Jane's thought that metaphors, because if you, if you think of metaphors, right, and think of our own experiences, I don't have access to the experience of any other person. There is no direct access. So what metaphors are, are something that we can all look at in outside. And actually the words of consciousness are derived from those metaphors. Those metaphors are used to come up with our concepts of consciousness. So those are like middle terms that two people can use to refer to each other's experience in an analogical way. So it is, it's a fundamental tool of communicating, yes. um, relating uh, to people's uh, experience. Right. Uh, so th that's, it's a great point. Uh, uh, it's a great point, uh, Katie, appreciate that. Next up is Dave. Yeah, Brian, I always enjoy uh, going on the journey with you. The question I have this evening is this co concept of opposite that you become the opposite. Uh, I think I'm kind of set in my ways. So I wonder if you could maybe explain that a little bit more or maybe give some examples. Thank you much. Sure, th th thank you for your question. So there are many uh, examples uh, I could give, but I think a, a, a very easy, a very common example is the opposites of masculinity and femininity. And of course, we have this, I, most societies have this idea that if you're born a man, you should be masculine. If you're born a woman, you should be feminine. But um, if you stop and think about it, actually, uh, we have uh, a man, if he's always just masculine, he's actually cutting himself off from a lot of experiences in the world. He certainly will have a hard time understanding the opposite sex. And of course, that applies to women also. And, you know, this may seem a little bit um, silly, but um, there's a two or three comedies, movies that come to mind. Um, Mrs. Doubtfire. I, I, I'm sure some of you have seen that. Um, but basically what that is about is Robin Williams trying to get in touch with his feminine side, if you will. And in the end, it helped him get through the divorce. It helped him reconnect with his children and even helped him connect with his uh, estranged wife. And so again, that, you know, I, I think it's always uh, useful to look at pop culture for examples. And to me, that, that just popped into my mind right now as an easy way to explain why and how. I mean, we don't all have to go to those uh, extremes like Robin Williams did in uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, but still, uh, and actually there's another movie with um, Dustin Hoffman, uh, Tootsie, where he also had to dress up like a woman. And uh, of course the idea is he learns more about 
not just what it means to be a woman, but he learns about his own inherent feminine side. Wonderful. Uh, folks, if you have questions, go ahead and type an uh, exclamation mark. Uh, Brian, we had a very interesting presentation on the ideas of Romano Gardini. Uh, and he makes a very profound philosophical point. He makes a distinction between contradictions and contraries. So for example, um, most Western thought is in terms of contradictions, it is either this or not that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at the Eastern thought, like the Chinese thought, yin yang, that's in terms of contraries. Contraries are the idea that both exist and both kind of flow have to flow into one another for health. And the classic example of that would be thinking about it from perspective of Jung would be the conscious and the unconscious. You need both of those. You need both of those to be, to be active. You need both of them. So you go from, so if you, for, for example, if you keep, kept your focus only on the conscious, you would be missing out on a large part of yourself, which is not, which you're not conscious of. So you have to be willing to listen to the unconscious when it suggests something at the edge of consciousness to look at it. Similarly, if you were to be dominated by unconscious, you would not really know where you're going. So <laughs> adding conscious to unconscious actually makes it even stronger. So they are contraries, not contradictories. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is a very profoundly different way of looking at it. Is that similar to what you're, you're saying? I think so. Yeah. So I think another way to uh, phrase it would be the difference between and or versus and both. So and or it's either A or B, but and both it can be it's A and B both go together and that you can't have a healthy existence unless you accept both A and B. Wonderful. Um, folks, I'm going to keep uh, keep asking questions to Brian, okay, until uh, if you have questions, they will get priority. The idea of the transcendent axis is a very profound idea. Because people talk about contraries, and you have to achieve a balance. But in that sense, the balance word is not good enough. Because it says that something has to be in some proportion, but it doesn't specify how. Mm. It doesn't specify the standard. So if you look at, for example, in the Chinese writing, I Ching is full of this yin yang. But if you look at Tao De Jing, it focuses on the Tao. It focuses on the way in which nature works using a dance of both the factors. And your mind should be focused on the way nature works of how, they, how it naturally goes between one on the, and the other. So in that sense, the Tao is the transcendent axis. It is not yin, it is not yang. It is the way in which both those work right. with each other, dance with each other. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and to get back to what you just said a moment ago, I think it's very uh, profound, this idea of, um, uh, li listening to one's unconscious. And so the challenge <clears throat> becomes, how do we do that from a practical point of view? What types of interventions or techniques, not just in the clinical setting, but uh, uh, what the, uh, how, how, how can a person self-discover? How can they engage in self-discovery? And of course, the, the, mo most people would agree that some sort of artistic endeavor is the way to do it. But I think the problem is people therefore assume that, well, I can't do that because I must train in art or I'm not a good artist. And they, um, they sort of uh, sell themselves, they, they sell themselves short and they, 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 they can't really think of a way to uh, discover new facets of themselves. Um, but as I said, there are many ways to do that. It does not have to be just in the conventional artistic sense. And even if you're not a good artist, there, everyone can write to a degree. You know, I tell my clients that all the time because 
anytime I bring that up about, well, why don't you journal about your problem? And then that way you'll get to know uh, not, not just what your problem is, not will you, you'll be, you'll be able to just not just delineate, but you'll also be able to uh, discover something about yourself and perhaps come up with, with some solutions. They all say to me, oh no, I can't write. I don't like to write. I, I never used to write in school. Mm -hmm. And I try to convince them that you don't have to write a lot. You just have to write a few sentences, even if it's over several days. But you have to start somewhere with something. Um, in, in any case, that, that's just sort of my, uh, my, my view that we, we're, we're not all um, great writers, but uh, as long as we can get something down on paper, whatever the information that can be, because when we look at it a week later or a month or two months later, what we wrote down can look very different from when we first wrote it down. And that, of course, can initiate, uh, 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 can, can start us on a path of self-discovery. Wonderful. I wanted to uh, pursue the main theme of today's talk of the self-individuation, the social benefits of highlighting individual differences. Uh, the most amazing example that we have looked at in our meetups is the book Principles by Ray Dalio. And what he does is that he actually, everybody tries to measure themselves and each other of what people's strengths are, what people's weaknesses are in a very open way. And when you do that, what happens is that if you know your strengths, your weaknesses, your ability to work with people goes up quite a bit. Because if you're saying that, look, I'm a very creative person, but I'm not that good at planning. If you identify clearly that that's, your, those are, that's the constellation of your strengths and weaknesses, you can simply work with somebody who is good at planning and you as a team, can perform a lot better than what you could do on your own. And perhaps that person is not as creative as you are. So the, the intersection there is far more potent than either of them together. But it all begins with the honesty of saying, who am I? What am I good at? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And doing the same thing with other people. So that being kind of the foundation. And when you accept that, that allows us, uh, allows a level of cooperation between people, which is truly, truly effective. What do you think? Yeah. So I think, um, I think you're right. I think that's a very important point. And I think the problem, especially in uh, a modern society, uh, I'm thinking of American society where supposedly individualism is so important. And what happens is we fall into the trap of thinking that individualism versus the group or individuality versus cooperation are somehow opposites or contradictions. They, they work against each other. And certainly that, that can seem to be the case sometimes. But the way I look at it, as I uh, mentioned before, the more we self-individuate, the more we find inner strengths and what's special, unique about me. And actually, not, not, not just strengths, but, all, but we also have to look at the negative side. As I said, what are my weaknesses? The more we discover those things, that actually sort of like a, a feedback system. It feeds into the group makes the group stronger, leads to more cooperation. And then that in turn leads to more self-individuation. It gives us a sort of confidence to continue our self-discovery, to develop perhaps skills that weren't there, that you know, the, the group allows us to develop these skills. So in other words, both the individual and the, the, the social organization, the group, however you want to express it, actually reinforce and help each other. And so in any case, that, that, that's how I look at it. Excellent. Mike, you have a question. Mike, what's your question? I'm, I'm trying to understand 
uh, the difference between individuation, actualization, and self-esteem. And uh, both in thinking of how uh, Socrates' dialogues worked, how uh, some of the Old Testament stuff worked, and how packs of wild animals do individuation and an actualization to accomplish their own brand of civilization and uh, how the all these things fit together if they do fit together and how that progressed uh, from um, what's going what went on in the peloponnesian war as compared to what went going on in afghanistan right now so that's uh, can you shout so can you solve my problem of understanding here can you go ahead and state the first question that was very crisp what is the difference between individuation self-actualization actualization and self-esteem and self and how, that how that Thank react you. how that uh, operates in terms sure. of uh, sure. civilization thank you past present and future so uh, when, when I hear self-actualization, I think of uh, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. And self-actualization is the, the ultimate um, level that one reaches. And as far as self-esteem, I would assume that self-esteem, having self-esteem is a product of, or it's generated by one becoming self-actualized. And for me, there's not, of course, there, there is a, a nuance uh, of, uh, of difference, I suppose, in the words actualization, individuation, but, but they overlap in my mind a lot. Um, I, I don't want to say that Maslow, when he talked about self-actualization, was, was talking exactly about individuation, but certainly individuation, I, I, I'm sure he would agree, plays a very important role in one's personal self-actualization. And to get back you know, to self-esteem, um, that's uh, something that we hear a lot about. And I know it seems to me there's been some criticism among educators that they have put too much focus on self-esteem and that the, the problem, they assume that the problem is, well, people just don't have enough self-esteem. So as long as we can boost their self-esteem, they'll be happier, more productive individuals. But of course, the question, the challenge is, how do you increase genuine self-esteem? I mean, it, it doesn't really help to be giving uh, awards and medals out to people if they really haven't accomplished anything. Um, but in any case, that's more of a footnote about this idea of self-esteem. But um, I think you had uh, another uh, question. He, he says, how, how does that impact? Uh, how, how would you apply it to, how does this issue apply to, let's say a pack of animals, pack animals? Right. How does this issue apply, say during the Peloponnesian War? So how did it apply during the Greek times, for example? How does it apply in the Afghanistan War? So how, you know, can, can, you, can you just look at it kind of in the animal world, early history and now? Okay, so yeah, that's, that's a bit of a challenge, but um, as far as in the animal world, um, yes, yeah, so uh, m many animals organize themselves, uh, a pack of wolves, an ant colony, um, and, but to me, of course, uh, there is a psychology, there, there, there is an animal psychology transpiring when wolves organize themselves in, into a pack. Um, and I suppose if a wolf, for whatever reason, breaks away from the pack, but that animal psychology is so different from human psychology. Um, I mean, wolves and humans are both mammals. Of course, they, they do share some important psychological traits, but for people, for humans, the, the, the psych the, the, the our, our psyches are organized so differently and uh, so complex really light years ahead of what a what a wolf can do um, that uh, I think we, we have to be a bit careful making um, comparisons 
Um, and then as far as history, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to relate this to um, uh, ancient battles or what, what's been happening in Afghanistan. Um, I, I, it, it's sort of uh, an, an issue of where does psychology and politics intersect, I suppose. Um, there's really not much. I, if you could give me something a little more specific, I suppose. No, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Don't ask Mike for specifics. He's going to drown us into concrete for the next 30 minutes. Sorry, just, just kidding, Mike. Sorry. Uh, no, he's, uh, I mean, Mike has this encyclopedic mind, which has, you know, where he can pull, pull everything. But I want to keep on the, on the topic, uh, you know, keep coming back to the topic. So uh, self-individuation. Um, so you started saying some things about strength and weaknesses. So what is the role of identifying your weaknesses in self-individuation? Well, you know, as I said, if you stop and think about it, if one is not really aware of their strengths, they're, they're going to be a burden on society. And if they're not aware of their weaknesses, they're also going to be a burden. Maybe not just not, not society per se, but certainly in your family, you know, to make things a little more concrete and specific. Um, if you if you don't if you lack a certain self-awareness, if you have not learned about yourself, um, uh, I, 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 just, I just can't see how that's going to lead to a healthy interpersonal relationships. I think one of the problems here is, you know, I grew up in the 1960s and 70s, and we used to hear a lot about um, finding yourself and uh, self-discovery. It sounds, it, it sounds very much like a 1970s expression. And I think that's unfortunate. And I think sometimes people use these terms too glibly. Uh, the truth of the matter is, it's not easy to engage in self-discovery. Uh, and of course, especially in, in, in the clinical setting. I mean, many times people come to uh, therapy because there's something about themselves that they don't know. There's something about themselves that they, they simply don't understand. There's something about themselves that perhaps they're denying. Other people have pointed it out for them. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, this idea of, of finding yourself actually is, uh, uh, is a value in itself and, and is quite important. And we have to think of a way to come up with a different vocabulary so it doesn't sound like we're just trying to re-warm up um the the, the 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 sort of 1970s uh idiom that um I, I think some people might turn their noses off at yeah i mean um yesterday we had a meetup on um psychological meaning of bible stories by jordan peterson and one of the uh, participants begor made a fantastic point so he was looking at this like the oh, he called the arc of the stories the story kind of starts somewhere, you're in a position, which is not that bad, then you pretty much have to go through hell, go through a really tough time in order to get back in a state better than you started out with. And progress is of that shape. The way in which um, Carl Jung puts it is that in filth, it would be found that you have, or if you look at the hero's journey, there is the abyss in the middle. You know, there is a start. You have to leave the city, leave the unknown parts, go out into the forest, kill the dragon, and bring back the gold to the city. But you have to face the dragon. You have to go out. So I think individuation, uh, I mean, that, what you're saying is it's not easy. And none of these people think it is easy. You know, yeah. in the stories, or if you look at Carl Jung, um, Joseph Campbell, you know, the, the stories of heroes, it's never easy. And you have to be willing to put up with that, go through that difficult patch in order right. to get to the other side. All right, right. Yeah, and you know, to add to that, uh, I would say that, so when we hear um, uh, about the, when we hear that expression, the hero's journey, and when we think back to 
the the writings of Joseph Campbell. Um, so I think what happened, some of us think that, oh, well, there these are people who had something important to prove. These are people who uh, uh, were on some quest uh, for the golden chalice or pe people, they, they had to fight a dragon in their neighborhood or something like that. But I think what's important to keep in mind is that whatever your problem is, it's important to you. And it could be something minor. I mean, someone could be perhaps physically or mentally challenged and they have to carry out a task that for them is a big challenge. And in, in their own way, they're being a hero. And so this, you know, what, what happens, I think in our scientific modern age, we have a tendency to sort of um, think of these things as, well, not being real somehow. They're nice stories that have to do with mythology. They have to do with lost civilizations or exotic places far away. But we forget that all these stories about heroes, these heroes do not have to be someone else. These heroes can be ourselves. They can concern our daily struggles, uh, w whatever that is. And uh, in any case, um, it, it's, it's, I guess what I'm str struggling trying to say is that it's difficult sometimes to convince people that in our, in our own way, we are all, we're all heroes. You know, we may not be fighting dragons, but we all have our challenges, big and small, that we have to confront each and every day. Now, excellent point. I mean, uh, Carl Jung's work is based on that idea where he looks at stories, mythologies, religions from every culture and looks for the patterns in them. And that patterns, those patterns are human patterns that each of us are going through. These stories are simply dramatic versions of the pattern, but the pattern is the same. Whether you are trying, you know, whether a child is learning how to walk yes, uh, right. or yeah. hero is going with it, for them, it is as great a task as going and conquering, uh, killing the dragon. Uh, so, uh, excellent point. Uh, next up is Katie. Yeah, that would have been a good example of analogy. Like what would be like a, for a child would be uh, the analogy there. Um, my question, what, what an archetype seems to me like you're almost like typecasting somebody into a story. Wouldn't that go against, I guess I'm confused how that does not go against self individualization where like everybody kind of charts their own path and does their own thing. That seems to be more like a story. Well, I think the way I would look at it is um, that the story for an individual, uh, for example, about a hero accomplishing some great deed or completing a task is just a beginning for a person. It's just an inspiration. It's just a template. Um, and that, of course, any person when they play the role of a hero trying to do whatever they have to do in their life, it's going to be that personal trajectory is going to be very individuated for them. So I don't think there's anything wrong um, with looking at these stories as long as we realize that these are just inspir uh, uh, inspiration. Um, it, it, uh, another way, I, I guess, to, uh, to describe them is uh, almost as uh, templates, something that we begin with. But of course, we know that my particular journey is not going to mirror exactly the, 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 that of the, the, the hero in some story. Wonderful. All right. Um, so folks, I just want to let you know, we're going to continue this conversation. But at nine o'clock, we have a meetup, which is going to be a much more, which is a conversational meetup where everybody is invited to talk about the ideas that they have found most useful in 52 Living Ideas meetup. You can pick up any idea that you have found useful and we will try to connect uh, these various ideas. Like for example, I've been doing with Brian here about connecting Tao the Jing with what he's saying 
Ray Dalio's work with what he's saying, what Jung is saying, this, the Bible stories, you know, we're trying to connect all of these things together. I think you understand things better when you see the patterns, you know, from these various angles. So that's what we're going to be doing um, starting at uh, nine o'clock. All right. Um, so, uh, Brian, this series is going really well. You know, I really like the theme of saying, how do you take Julian Jane's work and actually use it? One of the observations I have is that again and again, it is all about respecting an individual's ability to be conscious and how powerful that action, that faculty, that ability that all of us have, how powerful that is and how transformative that is. And the, the transformation can take time, it can be difficult, but that is the little you know, rudder that changes the big rudder that changes the ship. So I, I think that that is the biggest point that I'm getting from the entire series that we are doing here. But what do you think? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's a little bit difficult um, to uh, articulate uh, my, my thoughts on this, because I, it's almost as if I have an intuition about what Jane said about consciousness. And of course, James himself never really talked about its his views of consciousness, uh, how it directly relates to therapy. He hinted at it in two or three places. He hinted at it. And so what I'm trying to do is show how consciousness itself, um, if it's cultivated, if these different features of conscious interiority are better understood, if they're clearly delineated, um, they can be tools in self-transformation, self-change, um, and, and already in therapy, I mean, in a way, I'm not discovering anything new. I mean, these are used in therapy. It's just that they use perhaps a, a different words. I mean, I use self-individuation. The Jungians use in individuation. But, you know, more or less, there's tremendous overlap there. And so th what I'm trying to say is therapists have been using features of conscious interiority. It's just that they're not explicitly thinking about it that way, and they're not they, they may have different uh, have a different terminology to describe these uh, processes, but this is all about using something that people uh, already have. You know, we're socialized; we learn these uh, different features of conscious interiority. But I think the task should be how to enhance them and how to make them um, even more potent. Uh, let me do one thing. Um, let me ask you this question, which I was planning to ask you after nine o'clock. We have 13 minutes, so let's do this. How would you compare the thought of Carl Jung to that of Julian James? What, what are their views of human being and how do they, what is similar about it and what is different about them? Well, um, it's kind of a, a tough question because, um, um, you know, they, they had different agendas uh you know, jane's pretty much was driven by just one for him one big question which is what is consciousness whereas jung like a lot of people of his day and a lot, a lot of people today actually assume that there's just this thing called consciousness and of course jung i think jung's view of consciousness very much relates to his view of the unconscious, the, the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. And I'm not a scholar of Jung, so I'm not too sure. I might be wrong on this. But other than that, Jung never really investigated what consciousness is. Did consciousness, for example, exist throughout human history? When did it rise? When did it fall? Um, I think like a lot of us, he sort of assumed that people are, are uh, born with consciousness, that it's part of our neurological makeup. Where I, I will, I'll put it in a more extreme way. I would say that Jung was focused on the unconscious and his understanding of unconscious is very, very deep. 
Julian Jaynes was focused on the conscious and his understanding of consciousness is very deep. I don't think that Julian Jaynes' of view of consciousness contradicts Jung's view of unconscious. And I think if you bring both of those things together, that's a very powerful combination. You understand consciousness much better, thanks to Julian Jaynes, and you understand the unconscious much better, thanks to Jung. So that's how I, I look at these, these right. two giants. Right. And, uh, and, you know, I would add to that, you, you know, as we know, Jung is approaching it from a therapeutic, practical point of view. What can I, how, how can we develop theory or theories about consciousness and the unconscious um, to help people to transform people? Where, of course, with Jaynes, he wasn't really, that was not his primary interest or that wasn't his primary goal. What was his primary goal? Um, to to understand the the origins of consciousness. Mm -hmm. well, uh, and I think that you know some people hear that and it sounds a little bit strange. You know the origin of consciousness because many of us assume that consciousness has always been around and that animals have consciousness. Of course, animals have minds and they have very sophisticated cognitive processes but according to james the way james is using the word consciousness animals do not have consciousness and they cannot have consciousness uh, they just they, they simply do not have the neurocultural apparatus uh to develop consciousness um and so james you know that the key word there is the the origin of consciousness and what he is saying in that one word the origin is that consciousness is not innate to uh, humans, that consciousness is something that had to be culturally acquired. It had to be learned in the same way we invented certain types of politics. We invented certain forms of knowledge, certain types of sciences. We also had to, in a, in a sense, invent consciousness as a way to adapt and as a way to have societies transform themselves so they could keep up with all these great changes that were occurring about 3,000 years ago. Wonderful. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, Brian. This was fantastic. And let's be in touch to figure out when we want to do it uh, next. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll see you later. Uh, see you. Bye.